So um, since psoriatic arthritis was first described by Baron Jean-Louis Jean Alibert uh, in 1818, people have been struggling since that time to really decide is psoriatic arthritis a distinct arthropathy in the mix of all of them that are out there. There are over 100 different types of arthritis, and so trying to sort out what's what is, is important. And it's probably no more important than since the late, uh, since the early 1990s with the onset of biologic disease modifying agents, uh, that it really became paramount to, to discern, you know, what is, what is an active disease and what is a real disease versus something that, that is a, a mixture of a, of a bunch of different diseases. So it wasn't until probably about 1959 when a doctor in England by the name of Dr. Verna Wright, for 10 years I thought Verna was a girl. Anyway, it's, it's a guy. He had nine children. Um, so, but he was uh, really um, given great awards and accolades for describing basically five different types or five different presentations of psoriatic arthritis, and we'll briefly go through those. So anyway, it's been very interesting to see this uh, evolve over time. <coughs> So how often or how prevalent is it? Um, psoriasis um, um, can affect probably 1 to 3 percent of the population. About 10 to 30 percent of those patients that have psoriasis may go on to develop an, arth an associated arthritis called psoriatic arthritis. And so when we look at that, you know, unlike uh, different types of arthritis, say for example, or different connective tissue disease like lupus where the, the incidence of um, the male to female ratio is probably about eight or nine females to every one male for lupus. For this condition, it's pretty much one to one. For every male, there's one female. However, their presentations are a little different. Women tend to get a more polyarticular or diffuse or symmetric type of arthritis, almost, mi almost mimicking rheumatoid, or, or those young people, those juvenile onset uh, psoriatic arthritis patients, uh, tend to be more female than male. Whereas people that have psoriatic arthritis but tend to have more axial or spinal involvement tend to be more males, so about probably about three to one. But when you look at it overall, taking all classifications into account, it's pretty much equal gender, one to one, male to female. There are really two ages of occurrence, excluding the, the juvenile onset form. There's those people in their 20s and early 30s, and those people again in their 50s and 60s. Um, and we'll talk about some differences as we go along about that. Whites, more so than blacks or Asians. Again, a strong genetic kind of uh, inheritance pattern there. Probably about 40% of people with psoriatic arthritis have a history of psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis in the family, but not all. Um, I love this slide here. You can't see it, but I'll have to just show it out. <clears throat> the one thing that just drives me crazy every day at the office is, you know, there's always some new lead-in medical story on the previous night's news. Mm -hmm. And so here's this caption of the guy going, <clears throat> according to the report released today, and it has a spinning wheels, and it says coffee causes depression in frogs. So I thought that, you know, they just spin the wheel every night and give you something new. But, but this is the truth about the epidemiology. So the severity of arthritis, or the, uh, the severity of psoriasis, the skin, the skin disease, about two-thirds of these patients have mild disease. About one-third, obviously, then therefore have moderate to severe disease. Where it is true, in general terms, that the more severe the psoriasis, the more likely or more, or more likely the prevalence of psoriatic arthritis, okay? Um, it doesn't necessarily translate to mean that, um, that whether or not you have one of the five different causes, that necessarily yours is going to be one more severe than the other. Um, it is a lifelong disease, however, there are periods of relative um, uh, activity in relative uh, periods of quiet times or remission, and sometimes may last up to five years or more. I had a, a, a woman who presented who had psoriasis early in life in her 20s and 30s. She was quiet for nearly, nearly 30 years when it reemerged, and this time when it reemerged, instead of just having just the psoriasis, she was also developing psoriatic arthritis. So anyway, with, with psoriatic arthritis, again, you have, a, you have a, a certain subset. Again, tends to be more men, more men than women, but about half those people develop spinal involvement. That's what we refer to as spondyloarthropathy, meaning spond spondylo meaning spine, and arthropathy meaning uh, arthritis involvement. Okay. <coughs> um, 
until the understanding of genetic markers such as HLA-B27, which is positive in up to 60% of people with uh, psoriatic arthritis. Um, one of the hallmark uh, ways of determining whether or not people had psoriatic arthritis back in the time of Werner Wright and, and other of his colleagues back in the early 60s was the fact that they were not rheumatoid factor positive. So that was one of the hallmark features. You know, you couldn't have uh, rheumatoid arthritis positivity or rheumatoid factor positivity and call it psoriatic arthritis at that point. Because the, the general thought was before Werner Wright's, you know, landmark studies, was that people that had arthritis and psoriasis was basically, they had rheumatoid arthritis and they had psoriasis. Okay, it wasn't one thing, it was two different entities. Um, but about 40 to 60 percent of people with psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, that's the PSA, uh, psoriatic arthritis, develop erosive and deforming arthritis. Um, those kids that have um, uh, significant onset arthritis can have uh, deformities, um, but usually uh, some of the more severe erosive and deforming changes related to psoriatic arthritis are those people that in their 50s and 60s that get the late onset uh, psoriatic arthritis. But this certainly can affect the life of uh, the patient both physically and emotionally, um, and we'll talk about, or we, we can go back to that. Um, especially for young people, um, uh, young women, children. I mean, the, the skin rash is very, um, can be very difficult, it can be very mild, it can be hidden, you know, under clothes and things like that. But when it's on their hands or their face or, or places like that, um, it can be um, uh, disfiguring in their eyes. And so uh, that's, a, that's a real problem for people. Also, you know, some of, the time, some of these times it also affects their sleep because of the degree of arthritis or even the skin involvement and the itching and dryness that goes along with it. Types of psoriasis, there, there are really um, <coughs> five different types, but these are four major ones. The most are the uh, plaque psoriasis, probably involving about 80% of people. They're very sharply demarcated lesions. They're very, they're very round, they're very red, they're, they're kind of hypertrophic, they're kind of thickened and scaly. Um, they like the, the trunk, they love the, uh, the, the, the elbows, the knees, the scalp, those are very common areas for it. The second most common is the inverse psoriasis or intertriginous psoriasis, probably up to upwards of about 40% of people have that. It likes the skin fold areas underneath the breast, underneath the armpits, the groin, the cleft of the buttock, um, places like that. The next one is, is, this one is a tough one. Uh, I've only seen one case of that, and that was when I was at the Mayo Clinic of erythrodermic psoriasis. Uh, this tends to have a, a cyclical pattern to it, but it can be very diffuse. I mean, it can be so diffuse, in fact, and they'll just slough off literally sheets of skin uh, in this. And the problem when that happens, it leaves a lot of raw skin underneath. Lots of fluid shifts can have uh, cardiovascular collapse because of the high output kinds of changes that can happen. Uh, in result of this raw skin being, being uh, uncovered. So that can be a real difficult one, and thank goodness I've only seen one. Gutin psoriasis is one of the less common, maybe up to 2%, tends to be, can be in younger people. It's a very finer kind of uh, rash, uh, less scaling, more, more red, but just very small. These, these lesions could be as small as like two to three millimeters, so they can be real tiny, but they can be fairly diffuse. And the fifth type I didn't put up here was a type that typically occurs in, in much older people um, called palmar plantaris pustulosis, in which they can get, you know, where they can get the involvement of the palms of the, of, the, of the hands and the soles of the feet. The problem with that is that, that that particular one is just miserable at times because, you know, everything you do, everything you touch or walk or, or whatever like that, it's, it's very uncomfortable. You know, people don't pay much attention to it because they, they don't usually, we don't walk around doing this all day long, but but it can be a very difficult one to, to deal with. But there are other, what we refer to as extra articular manifestations related to psoriatic arthritis. And, and these are very important because sometimes it gives us the key to the diagnosis. Although probably 60 to 80% of the time, the psoriasis predates the onset of the arthritis, okay? But that also means that 20 to 40% of the time, the, the arthritis shows up first. Okay, so when the arthritis shows up first, 
you have to go looking for other signs or other clues that this is psoriatic arthritis. You know, do they have a family history? Again, about 40% of these people will have a, a positive family history of psoriasis. But then you look for other things. You look for nail changes. One of the common things we see are nail pitting like this, and you see, you see that here, okay? And it does, it looks like somebody just took a, like a little nail and just, like a, like a hammer nail, and just took the nail and just kind of, you know, like that, all the way around the nail. The other thing you see is onycholysis, where actually the bottom of the nail separates from the skin. And you see how far it goes back here? That's usually painless, by the way. It looks tough. The thing you have to worry about this one is just not to mistake it for a fungal infection. So it's important to kind of check those out. But usually when you start to see things kind of snowball, you know, a likely appearance, you know, the type of skin involvement, um, nail pitting, you know, that type of thing. Once you get like three or four characteristics on board, all of a sudden you realize, well, gee, this, this isn't fungal, this is, this is psoriatic arthritis. So the nail pitting here, we saw that here. Um, about 20% of people will get um, conjunctivitis or just reddening of the eyes uh, related to psoriatic arthritis. Up to 7% can actually get a true uh, internal uh, ocular inflammatory response that, that needs to be treated with steroids uh, in order to prevent damage and even potential blindness. Um, asymmetric oligoarthritis, fancy terms, asymmetric just meaning it's not symmetrical. It's, it's one side more than the other, okay? Uh, oligoarthritis is a fancy way for, uh, of what we designate, meaning the very few joints are involved. Typically, by definition, less than five joints are involved, okay? And so what you see here is really interesting is that <clears throat> you see significant swelling of this wrist versus this one. You see the tendons kind of, kind of poking out here, and all of a sudden you just see kind of a just a diffuse swelling there. And then you'll see uh, normal looking digits here, but all of a sudden you'll see this, this kind of boutonniere deformity here where it's kind of poked up, okay, on the, on the long finger and the, the fifth finger, okay. Dactylitis, okay, this is referred to as a sausage digit. Uh, I don't know why in medicine we always describe things in the terms of food, but it's really disgusting. Um, but anyway, it, it kind of looks like a sausage. And, and, you know, when you look at these others, you know, the other toes are, are relatively uninvolved, but that one clearly is red, hot, and swollen. And then, of course, there's enthesitis, which just basically means inflammatory changes within the tendon at the site of bone insertion. And for this person, it's at the base of the Achilles, where the Achilles comes down the back of the, of the calf and attaches onto the calcaneus. So this is all synovial swelling at the attachment site of the, <coughs> of the Achilles. And of course, the concern about that is if it's left unchecked and goes on and on and on, that patient's at risk for Achilles tendon rupture. Okay. And it also has some therapeutic implications, which we'll talk about. Um, well, so here's where Werner Wright and, and others, uh, Maul and, and Baker, uh, started describing these patterns of psoriatic arthritis involvement in, in the late 50s and early 60s, and ultimately, again, related to the seminal work. Uh, finally, in 1964, the American um, uh, College of Rheumatology uh, actually accepted uh, psoriatic arthritis as an independent arthritis. So there's five different uh, presentations, distal joint disease, oligo or a few, or a few uh, arthritis, poly, meaning many, more than five, uh, arthritis mutilans, and spondylitis. Uh, one of the things I, I really find interesting in what I do is that a lot of what I do is, um, it's like detective work. You know, I'm looking for clues and trying to put all the pieces of the puzzle together, but it's also like putting a regular jigsaw puzzle. You look at their hands and you're looking for pattern recognition. You know, just like when you're sitting on doing a jigsaw puzzle, you know, I need, I, need, I need an eye that matches this eye over here, you know, kind of thing. And, and so what you will see here is that's what you see in rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is typically a very symmetrical and very complete type of arthritis. It, <clears throat> you know, if you had a person with rheumatoid arthritis, both hands would look like this with equal involvement of the PIPs, the MCPs, the wrists, okay? Whereas with psoriatic arthritis, as we talked about before, with an oligoarthritis or few joint presentation, what you can see is something like that. You can see somebody with a sausage digit, then all of a sudden they'll have one, one joint involved here, you know, or, or the same way for the feet. It's, it's kind of a hop, skip, and a jump. Now, the other thing I want to point out to you, when we were talking about psoriatic arthritis before the definition in 1964, people thought that psoriatic arthritis was actually rheumatoid arthritis plus psoriasis, okay? Well, what kind of does that differ? And again, 
<coughs> was when we, when we were able to look at rheumatoid factors, you know, if they had a rheumatoid factor, then it wasn't psoriasis in that regard. But the other thing is that rheumatoid arthritis very rarely, if ever, involves the distal interphalangeal joints, these, these in joints right here, which would be, which would be these, these right here, okay? Whereas psoriatic arthritis has a real strong predilection for the DIP joints. So right there, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a big clue, so you don't want to miss that. Okay. So distal joint disease. What's, what's interesting about this is that um, <coughs> um, when people have psoriatic nail changes, they almost always have DIP joint disease. And again, almost always. There's always the exception to the rule. But the reason is, is because whatever happened in the nail probably started in the nail bed, okay? which is actually just a, you know, a stone's throw from the DIP joint. So if they have that amount of inflammation to distort the nail, they typically have this, this DIP joint involvement. And here you see right here where the, the edge of the bone has been eaten away. You see that kind of hourglass kind of shape to the end of this bone here, or this bone here? Then right here it's kind of been whittled down to a, a point. That's referred to as a pencil and cup deformity. And sometimes it actually, actually looks just, just like a pencil and a cup. What happens is this becomes in such a point, it burrows down into the end of the bone, and it looks like a pencil sitting down in a cup. Okay. <clears throat> but again, DIP joints, again, more so in the hands than in the feet. Then the oligoarthritis, more commonly in men, uh, especially those with spondylitic or spine involvement, Again, typically less than five joints. <clears throat> and I loved how they posed this fellow here, because they're trying to show you, although they're doing it very badly, he has, a, he has a swollen knee, okay? He also has psoriasis here, and he's got this boutonniere deformity with his, with his uh, hand involvement. But this is typically what you see. I mean, this guy has kind of a generous hand, but what you'll see is you'll see some, some dystrophic changes in this nail here and there. Usually what you'll see with psoriatic arthritis patients is they don't like the way it looks at the end, so they typically keep their nails real short, you know. And, uh, but, but again, the, um, the, the, you know, un unquestionably, not only is this a little flexed in that position, but it's also swollen relative to these fairly normal looking joints associated with it. <clears throat> um, again, fewer than five joints we talked about. And, uh, and again, a large joint, it loves the knee. Also, the ankle is not an uncommon one either. Okay, the polyarthritis. Again, these are the people that look more like the rheumatoid kind of appearance. But if you're, if you're careful and you look closely, there are some subtle differences. Again, a relative asymmetry to it. You know, it doesn't look as symmetrical as a pure rheumatoid. DIP or distal interphalangeal joint involvement. They tend to be rheumatoid factor negative. Of course, they have psoriasis. So, you know, and plus the radiographic images look a little bit different. You'll see right here, in some cases, you'll see some sparing of the metacarpal phalangeal joints, but then you'll see erosions here, but you see significant involvement of the wrists, okay? So, again, that kind of atypical or asymmetric kind of presentation gives you a kind of clue. So, we talked about the, about 25% of patients, again, more typically female than male, uh, seronegative or blood test negative for rheumatoid factor. And again, looking for the characteristic features. Arthritis mutilans. I have one um, lovely little lady in my practice. She's just a deer, and, and she is just so incredibly patient. But, but she has truly deforming arthritis like this. And um, she is much saner and calmer than I would ever be if I had to deal with that on a day-in, day-out basis like she does. She has significant spondyl uh, spondylitis as well as uh, peripheral arthritis, and then of course she has these, these uh, destructive changes. And what happens is the bones basically get eaten away and, and the, the skin just becomes redundant and actually as the digit shortens, it just kind of telescopes down on top of itself. And that's what they refer to as a telescoping or opera glass hand deformity. Okay. Psoriatic spondylitis, really interesting. Um, there are different types of HLA B27 spondyloarthropathies, a classical one being ankylosing spondylitis, which tends to be very inflammatory, a lot of inflammatory back pain, 
tends to be very noticeable. These people kind of squeak in sometimes. You don't really pick up, you know, only if you really pin them down and say, gee, you know, what's your back pain like? They go, oh, you know, I've had it for 20 years, it's nothing, you know, it's just they go on with their life, you know. But then you start to kind of, you know, pin them down on it and find out it is, it is more significant. And, and what's real interesting about this is it tends to start in the lower spine and kind of over the years kind of work its way up as far as inflammatory response. So you can kind of see them move, or the, their spine involvement move up. Um, the spondyloarthropathies, the spondylitis, this is where the biologic agents have just really put this disease uh, in, under better control. I mean, this is where the traditional disease-modifying agents, things like methotrexate, leflunamide, sulfasalazine, azathioprine, whereas those medicines that we've used for rheumatoid arthritis for many years really have very little, if no effect, on spine involvement, okay? Whereas the biologic DMARDs, the, the Imbrels, the Humiras, the Remicades, et cetera, et cetera, uh, they have revolutionized our treatment and the treatment of this condition. I mean, we're maintaining people with, you know, active lifestyles and better range of motion. Um, it's just sometimes hard convincing the insurance company that that's what we need to do. Because unfortunately, their, their goal is, you know, I have a, I have a new patient that has rippling uh, uh, psoriasis, uh, a Catholic priest from out west. He comes in, his only involvement is the spine, okay? He has terrible psoriasis. He's worried because when he goes to do mass, people look at his hands and stuff like that, and they're not sure they actually want to shake his hand. You know, and, and if you're trying to, you know, pastor your flock and people, you know, are trying to avoid you, it's tough. So, I mean, I had all this information that we really need to start this guy straight away on a biologic agent. Of course, I wrote his insurance company and they just basically laughed and their response was, we don't think it's indicated. And I said, I wish we were taking care of the patient because this is what he needs. Especially when we do have evidence to suggest that really the biologic agents are really the only way to go for people with significant uh, spine involvement. A couple of interesting things with the advent of MRI as you see, this is what is called a type A or Anderson inflammatory lesion, where it actually involves the disc and the in plate of the, the vertebral body. That's, the, that's the, the spinal body right there. This, um, I guess I should give you, you guys probably aren't used to looking at MRIs all the time. This is the back, <laughs> the lower back here. Uh, tail's down here, your head's up here, okay? So there's five lumbar vertebrae. This is the sacrum here, so five, four, three, two, one. And these are your thoracic vertebrae going up. This is your spinal cord, this white thing right here, okay, through there. Actually, it's the whole spinal canal. Actually, the part of the spinal cord is that little gray thing sitting right there, running in there, okay? And then you see it over here, okay? Usually, usually the spinal cord kind of tapers off about L2 or L3, and then just the nerves going down and out to the legs. And then what you also see is something that really has been seen in early spondylitis involvement is the idea of what they refer to as a shiny corner. You see that little whiteness of the corner of the, there here? Not so, that's probably an early Anderson lesion, but you see a little whiteness of that, that corner? That's what's referred to as shiny corners. And actually, <clears throat> there are a lot of radiologists that now believe that probably the first sign of shiny corners in the midst of all this <clears throat> is actually up within the thoracic spine, even though clinically, the symptoms tend to start here in the lower spine. Okay, then you have what they refer to as parasyndesmophytes. And this is interesting because they, they, there are different types of bone attachments here. You see it has kind of a comma-shaped appearance. Also, <clears throat> with more wear and tear changes of the, of the spine, you tend to get these, these um, bone spurs that come down both sides, okay? Where in psoriatic arthritis, so it tends to be more unilateral. So he has one on this side at that level, then he has one on this side at that level. But you look at the opposite sides, and they look pristine, you know, so. I, it's amazing, just amazing. Okay, and then you can also get sacroiliitis. You can get inflammatory changes within the sacroiliac joints through here. Okay, so Casper, <coughs> um, it's basically, um, it's a categorization of psoriatic arthritis. And so they're saying, well, how do, we, how do we go about making the formal diagnosis? And so the idea is that here are all the different categories of uh, current uh, psoriasis in the patient, uh, personal or family history of psoriasis, uh, nail changes, they're negative for rheumatoid factor, they have dactylitis, remember that swollen digit, okay, or radiographic evidence of, of new bone formation. And so anyway, they're, they're, they're associated with several points, and the idea is that if you have three points, 
then that qualifies as a diagnosis for psoriatic arthritis. Okay. So for the treatment of psoriasis, and that's where we originally started treating people with, with psoriatic arthritis, we kind of took, we kind of jumped on the bandwagon of the dermatologists who had been kind of dealing with this for a while. Um, but, but generally, the dermatologists, they just want to treat the skin, you know, and they don't really care about what the joints do. Of course, the majority of the patients, again, just have skin involvement, so I can't completely throw rocks at them for that. I just wish that when their patients do develop arthritis that they at least let us treat them. <laughs> so, um, so a lot of topicals, uh, coal tar and anthralin. Um, this is what they would do during, in, you know, way back when you could put people literally in the hospital for months for coal tar treatments. And what they would do, they come in in the morning, they slather coal tar on them and wrap them up in these towels or, or, or bandages. And they would give them pajamas and slippers because this coal just stains everything, their skin, their clothing, their bedding, everything. And on the coal wars, uh, wards, uh, you walk on it, you can actually smell the coal tar. <clears throat> it's pretty interesting. But, of course, we can't do that much anymore. And it's hard for people, and short of being hospitalized, it's harder for people to do that because it's just so intensive. <clears throat> Very rarely, but yes, in some in some centers it is. It's just you know, it's just too difficult. Yeah, uh, calcitoprol. Um, that is a um, that's a vitamin D um, drug. Actually, it's very good. It, it works quite effectively. It's a topical agent, and then topical corticosteroids. Then you get to the photo stuff. Um, uh, Puva is ultraviolet A with methoxysorolin and. Um, it's really quite good. Um, in Caucasians, there is a higher incidence of skin cancer, which kind of, you know, obviously, you know, limits its use somewhat. But in short periods, uh, PUVA can be quite helpful. A lot of people, a lot of dermatologists now are using narrow band UVB. Not quite as good as PUVA, but, um, but nevertheless can be effective. And then for systemic involvement or more <coughs> diffuse skin involvement, then the retinoids, um, that's the vitamin A, uh, methotrexate, cyclosporin. Cyclosporin is a good drug. It just knocks psoriasis out, which is great. The problem is uh, cyclosporin is hard on the kidneys, blood pressure, elevations, things like that. And then, of course, the advent of the biologic agents since the early 1990s. So we get to, okay, how do we decide to treat these people? So this is a really interesting group that got together called GRAPA. It was actually spearheaded by the European Union because of their need for socialized medicine or their desire for socialized medicine. When the biologics came along, okay, you're talking about drugs that are, that are $25,000, $30,000 a year, <coughs> and, and with a socialized medicine system, they don't want to spend that money on everybody. So they were trying to figure, okay, how do we go about you know, categorizing people so who gets the drug and who doesn't? And so mild, moderate, and severe. You know, the number of joints you have, less than five, more than five. Uh, and again, uh, whether or not you have um, joint damage on x-ray, uh, how much skin involvement you have, uh, whether you have spinal disease or a failure to respond to, to lesser therapies. But what's nice about this group, it was a combination of rheumatologists, dermatologists, and, and basically what they called methodologists, meaning statisticians. And they all sat down. And what, they, what was really nice about that is what they took everything into account. They took the arthritis into account. They took the skin into account, the spine into account. You know, they looked at all the major classifications of psoriatic arthritis and came up with this program. Um, and so here, here basically are their guidelines. And what you'll see, and I mean, we always want to be conservative. So people usually start off with non steroidal agents, maybe some intraarticular corticosteroids, and then the, the traditional biologic agents, methotrexate, cyclosporin, sulfasalazine, leflunamide, and then you ultimately get to the anti-TNF agents. And that's great for peripheral arthritis, but you can see here, if you have axial or spinal disease, dactylitis or enthesitis, you don't see anywhere in there where they use the traditional DMARD agents. They go straight to the biologics, okay? And that's what's hard to convince <coughs> insurers in this country that, you know, this was an independent group on a continent away from us that, have, you know, that are cost conscious, okay? And they're saying, look, you know, don't do this. Let's go straight to the biologics in that particular instance. Um, okay. 
So treatment, mild disease, again, we try to treat it mild, especially if somebody has an oligoarthritis, they have two or three swollen joints. Sure, let's try the non first. I mean, let's try the simple things. If we're able to control the disease uh, from a joint standpoint and they do fine, then great, let's, let's watch them, let's see what happens. Um, um, ketoprofen is kind of interesting. Um, uh, it, it tends to have a better effect for peripheral joint manifestations. And indomethacin uh, is much more favored in the treatment of axial disease. Why is it? Why is that non more specifically helpful for back pain? That's a really good question. But people that have HLA-B27 disease, a genetic marker, indomethacin tends to be a really good drug. <clears throat> And then, and then from moderate to severe disease, then we go to the traditional biologic agents. Again, if we're usually talking about peripheral joint involvement, not the axial spine involvement. Okay. And then here's the biologic therapies. And this is really interesting stuff. And I, I put this together to give you kind of a snapshot of, <clears throat> you know, why, why is this important? And so what they did was they looked at the different TNF inhibitors. There's uh, basically four here. There, there has been one more uh, called Simzia or Sertilizumab that has been approved for psoriatic arthritis. But I, I put these four here in the references you, or microscope. I feel like a car salesman, but here it is down the bottom. Um, but anyway, Remicade here, Humira, uh, Symphony, and uh, Inbrel. Now, ACR 20, 50, 70 basically refer to the patient's joint count, okay? And, and three out of five indicators, things like inflammatory response, um, you know, hemoglobin, you know, a lot of different factors trying to look at, trying to look at what kind of response are we getting. And if you make a 20% improvement, then you have fulfilled ACR20 criteria. If you make a 50% improvement, there and there. Now again, not all studies actually looked at uh, ACR50 and 70. And the reason that is very simple. The FDA only makes them improve ACR 20s, okay? And they don't want to test something with an ACR 50 or ACR 70 and then have the FDA come back and say, well, gee, it didn't do good enough there. We're not going to approve the drug. So they only do the 20s, which is unfortunate. Okay. A PASI score, basically this is a, a psoriasis activity uh, index. And, and what it looks at is a, a, pa a positive PASI score is if the patient has a 75% reduction in skin manifestations. Now that's that's significant, 75%. Okay, <clears throat> and then whether or not they have radiographic evidence that they're helping to prevent erosions. So for Inbrel, you'll see, for example, for the ACR20, it's a 59% response. I'm not late, am I? No, I'm good, okay. So a 59% response, but the placebo or sugar pill response was 15%. But you see for Symphony, it was 48 and nine, and here's, uh, uh, Humira was 58 and 14, which is, which is comparable to Etanercept. Um, uh, the difference for that is when you look at the PASI scores for Inbrel, yes, your joints did really good, 60% response there, but only about 23% response of uh, a 75% reduction in skin manifestations. Where you see a comparable joint response with Humira, you see, you know, double plus uh, response to their skin. So usually for people's psoriasis, I tend to favor Humira over Inbrel uh, in that particular situation. I really like Remicade a lot. Uh, it's almost necessary for patients that are Medicare age because, because these others are self-administered. Uh, Medicare won't pay for it, but if I can infuse it in the office, for some reason Medicare will pay for it. So, and the other thing that's nice about Infliximab or Remicade is that the dosage is basically based upon your body weight. So, you, I mean, there is some wiggle room. You have three to 10 milligrams per kilogram body weight, but, but you also have that, that luxury. Whereas with these other three, it's one size fits everybody, whether or not it does, okay? So whether you're, you're a 100 pound lady or a 300 pound guy, you get the same dose, okay? With infliximab, we can basically dial up the dose to what you need or what you don't need. If you don't need, you know, as much to control, then you back down the dose. But again, a 75% response to the joints and about a nearly 75, a nearly 70% response to the PASI 75. And what you'll see here, <clears throat> unfortunately, with the Symphony study, they just didn't look at whether or not it helps prevent joint damage, but they did, they did in the Embrel study, the, the Humira study, and the uh, Remicade study. So 
positive results there. And so anyway, these, these medicines have really revolutionized people's lives with respect to not only the joint manifestations, but their skin as well. And then of course, I mean, you know, you have celebrity endorsements. So, you know, if you're a, a Humera fan, then Leanne Rhymes and country music is the way to go. And if you're, if you like golf like me, then, you know, Phil Mickelson is your guy, you know, so. Uh, but we have a lot of new choices. Um, there are new things coming. Uh, the anti-TNF agents, which is basically everything I've been talking about before, uh, which help block a, a very primitive inflammatory response. We're now looking at other, um, other things in the research world, uh, IL-6, IL-20. Um, you know, these are things we're actually looking at in our clinical research arm downstairs. Um, very promising drugs. We'll see, we'll see what happens. So, you know, things are, things are shaking. We'll see, we'll see what, how things go. So that's my talk, as I was hoping to spend the rest of the time for questions. Yeah. How do either one of those affect your liver? Uh, usually not. I mean, there have been reports of uh, elevations in liver transaminations, AST, ALTs. Right. Um, you know, they're, they're talking probably less than 5%. Methotrexate is much more commonly affects the liver. Um, um, well, you know, I, I see that, but a lot of things. I mean, the, the as my as my pathology prof professor in medical school said, you know, the liver is a trash can of the body. So I mean, basically everything gets shunted through the liver to be detoxified and, and getting rid of. So, um, you know, but we're never pure. I mean, what happens is the person also. I mean, you know, maybe they're maybe they're t a little heavy or they're on a lipid drug for their cholesterol, you know, uh, like a statin drug, or, or, or they're on a non steroidal agent, or, you know, uh, just a lot of different things. And, and sometimes trying to sort out, you know, what's their cause of their liver disease, you know, is, is, a, is a real real problem. But in, in my experience, in my practice, uh, very few times have I ever seen that, that one of these drugs was the cause of that. It's usually something else. I have, I have, it has been seen, it has been reported, so I don't want to sit here and tell you it doesn't happen, but it's just not, it's not common. Great question. Yes, ma'am. I'm not even quite sure how to ask this question, so bear with me. Okay. So does, so thinking of the skin symptoms, <clears throat> does controlling the skin symptoms... It appears so. <laughs> Go ahead, finish your question. It appears so. Okay. Again, I mean, it, it's, it's difficult sometimes to sort that all out because, you know, when, when you're trying to do a scientific study, you're trying to compare apples to apples. Well, none of us are apples. I mean, we're, we're individual people. And we all have our own, you know, things that we're dealing with. And so, but the general philosophy has been in the rheumatology world is that if you control the skin manifestations, you will uh, have a favorable impact upon the psoriasis. A generality. Not, is it a hard and fast rule? No, but, but, but that's why we talk about trying to get everything under control at once. And I try to work really closely with the dermatologist because really they don't want to monitor these big guns, you know? And quite honestly, I don't want to deal with all the lotions and stuff. I, I, you know, there's a new one every day and they have names I can't pronounce or remember. So, and plus they can cost, you know, holy cow, you know. So I try to work pretty closely with my dermatology colleagues to be sure that we're, you know, trying to do the right thing. Good question, though. Any other? Yes, ma'am. Treatment with the biologics generally include um, Yes, um, and that probably part of that is um, probably historical because we know, especially in rheumatoid arthritis, the combination of methotrexate plus a biologic agent works better than either one alone, and we've kind of adopted that philosophy with psoriasis as well. Yes. I, and I think, and I think it's true. I think it does help more. And if you've been on a biologic for a long time and you, your symptoms have been kind of in a remission, is it your practice to keep that patient on the biologics, or do you ever try to wean them off? Um, you know, that's a great question, and it's very, and quite honestly, it's very individualistic. You know, I have some people that come in and say, "Gee, I'm doing really great. I'd like to take a holiday and see what happens." And then, and then I have a couple of guys. They're always guys. Um, they come in. Oh, if I take my Humira shot every 18 days instead of every 14 days, I have a guy who takes his Humira every 11, his uh, Inbrel every 11 days. Well, it's meant to be taken once a week. He goes, I can go 12 and 10 is too early, but I can go 11 and that works really well. So, I mean, you know, uh, is there any scientific trial to say that that's efficacious? No, but he, it works for him. Um, 
I usually have two arguments. Well, not arguments is such a strong word. I have two long discussions with patients. One, trying to convince them to try the biologic agent, and the second one, trying to convince them to stop the biologic agent. Because, you know, it just, they do so well, you know. Uh, again, not to be a poster boy for, you know, or whatever, whatever for these drugs. I mean, it, um, the, as you know, they all have their risk and benefits. And, um, and I think with psori psoriatic arthritis, I, I think there is a, a consideration of trying to stop it. Um, our fear as rheumatologists, and again, this is historical, our fear has always been, especially with rheumatoid, is that once you have the monster down, you don't ever let it up again. Because there's no guarantee that if rheumatoid reactivates after stopping a DMARD, that you're going to control it with the same DMARD or you're going to control it at all. Now, is that more fear than science? Could be. So in your estimation, is it better to keep that person on it for years even though they might be able to get off the control? You know, honestly, I, I take the I, I take the patients I take the patients' wishes into account. I mean, if you came to me and said, "Gee, I'd like to really try stopping this," you know, I may whimper a little and you know, complain and, and whatever like that. But but I'm probably going to go for it if if you know if your disease is under really good control and whatever like that. Uh, but with the understanding that, gee, if the first sign that we see that this is not going our way, we get back on it. Now, the, the only problem with that happens, to, for example, would be with Remicade. Remicade or infliximab is not a fully humanized protein, and so there's a concern that the longer you're off Remicade, that if you re-challenge with Remicade, that your body may reject it the second time and, and cause more risk for infusion reactions or anaphylaxis. <coughs> but for Humira and Imbrel, I haven't seen that kind of phenomenon. Did I evade that question sufficiently? To, so, um, but you know, I hope that helped a little. Yes. There's a question over. Yes. I was just saying, good answer. Right? I thought that was a great answer. Oh, well, thanks. It's it's you know, about the time I think I got it all figured out, and I know what I'm going to do on every single patient. I have another patient walks in the room that completely blows it out of the water and go, okay, we're back to the drawing board, and and we say because I mean everybody's different. Yeah. Um, oh, oh, good question. Um, because, you know, as you look at... Yeah, no, like, for example, methotrexate, when you look at it, probably 66% uh, of people are on methotrexate in their third year going on mm -hmm. because you have a failure rate of 33% or whatever. Um, I haven't seen it as much with the biologics. Now, have I seen a, a biological failure? Yes, I have. And especially um, Yeah, but I, I don't I don't call that a failure because you know I mean you you intentionally cut the dose you know, but um, it just means that they needed it and I took them off of it and I shouldn't have done it, you know so I put them back on it and and usually I mean it generally has been my my experience that if I put them back on the biologic we regain control, it's just my fear that that we might not control them again. Okay. <clears throat> but I can't say that it just sticks out of my mind that you know. Everybody that I take off that reflares that they're not going to we're not going to recapture them again. Um, yeah, but but anyway, it's there are some people that are biological failures. In which case, what we do is we try a different biological agent. You know, yeah. Good question. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yeah, Humira is starting to wake up, and they're starting. To, they have a few Medicare age programs. Uh, available to kind of help with the copay and stuff like that if you have commercial insurance. If you have Medicare insurance, it becomes a, a real problem, uh, just Medicare. Um, what I've done in that particular instance is I look at other things like switching them to Inflix or Remicade or switching them to Simsia. Uh, Simsia is a, a twice a month, uh, kind of a la the uh, Humira, that you have to come into the office so that we can administer it, but Medicare will cover that which is kind of surprising. Every once in a while we get some resistance from Medicare on the Simsia, but we, usually we check that all out ahead of time. But Remicade, Remicade's not a problem. <clears throat> Have you found that a lot of the insurance companies are trying to get you guys, you guys, I mean, you doctors to try alternative? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I've had to have my, I've had to, you guys write to my insurance company. 
Yeah, and it's becoming it's becoming more and more of a of a hassle because um, uh, one of my partners wrote on the behalf of a patient after he got his fourth letter back saying, you know, we're not doing. He finally was able to work his way through the phone tree in about 45 minutes and actually get to the the man who actually wrote the four letters. And he goes, I didn't write any of those letters. He goes, your name's on it. He goes, oh, my staff did that. So it's a form letter, letter. yeah. Which means the guy didn't even really consider these things. So it's, they're making it so intentionally hard that you'll just finally just say, I give up. And the problem is, you know, there's just not enough time in the day to do that for every single patient we see, and it's becoming really frustrating. The other thing I, the other thing that's a problem is like, you know, um, insurance company A will say, okay, if you're going to try any of these five drugs or whatever, okay, we want you to use this one first. And why is that? Well, because they hooked a deal. And I understand that, but, but you know, not every single medicine is for every single patient. That's why we have five of them. So the problem is, you know, they're practicing medicine without a license as far as I'm concerned. But, but the problem is I don't have any control over that, which, which is is difficult and it's difficult for the patient because I mean quite frankly who can afford these drugs I mean either the insurance says yes or, or you're done I mean because you can't you can't otherwise afford it you know when did Simsia become approved for psoriatic oh I'm you know, I couldn't tell you last couple of years I think really? I, I think I, I mean I have to but I I recall it being approved so I mean do I have anybody on Simsia that's on psoriatic I have I have probably ten people on Simsia for rheumatoid, but um, I, yeah, I think it has been approved. I mean, I don't sit here and lie to you, but I, I, I I'm almost ninety five percent sure it's approved. Now it's not approved for ankylosing spondylitis, which is really unfortunate because ankylosing spondylitis again another HLA B twenty seven driven disease. I mean. So, anyway, crying in my milk again. Okay, good question though. Other questions? Or about any other kinds of arthritis or? Um, oh yeah. Um, yeah, I'll talk to you in, about that in a second. Yes. Um, you know, I can't say that I ever have.